This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. And there we go. In five games, the whole Calgary Flames playoff run is over. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And uh, Matt I think we got a, a lot things. to talk about this week. Well, let's start with talking about the three games. You and I talked after game two of the series, after the two Calgary home games, and the series was 1-1. Uh, Calgary went in after that to Denver for game three and ended up losing 6-2 to two to the Avalanche in... Um, Kale McCarr, a Calgarian's NHL debut. This is a big game for the Avalanche. Really, I think, swung the tide in their favor. McKinnon had three points in this game. This is the one where I really think, and you and I talked about this before the series started, I think Calgary's going to underestimate um, the Avalanche. And I said coming in, I think the Avs would win the first one in their barn. This was not a good look for the Flames, and I really think they underestimated yeah, what the that Avalanche was. Was perhaps the single worst game I've seen the Calgary Flames play in the playoffs ever. So, you know, the, uh, a small bar to go over. Yeah, <laughs> I was. I, I, I don't. I don't think we need to get into a lot of this game. It was a terrible Flames game, but I was hoping that we would see the Flames come in ready to go, especially after, a, you know, a pretty close game in game two. I was hoping we'd come out and see the same thing. And I don't know what happened to the Flames here. They they won the faceoff 61%, um, but they were, as we saw late in the series too, paraded to the box, 50 penalty minutes, 5-0 in this game. And it was crazy. Like, there was how many... Unsportsmanlike yeah, conduct the team just alone. got o- completely overwhelmed and they had no response at all. And so they took frustration penalties and it, it just a dumb game all the way around. But like there was the only guy who played well was Smith. And frankly, even though he gave up six, that could have easily been f- 12 or 13 had he been having just an OK game. It's true. So I was hoping after this game the Flames would have it. Do you remember what was it early in the season when the Flames played against Pittsburgh and they lost 9-1 at the Dome and that's really when the season turned around? I was hoping that's what ha- what would happen here and the Flames would rally back for game four. But again, not the result we were looking for, even though it was on the scoreboard a pretty close game. It was a 3-2 to two overtime win for the Avalanche. Again, not a great yeah, game. Yeah, and like if you look at the game, they got up to nothing, and d- despite Colorado playing better than the Flames, I think even though it got up to two nothing, and then the Flames just stopped playing entirely, which allowed Colorado to come back and win the game and push us to the brink. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it was a 2 nothing start for the Flames. We had a Lindholm score in the second and Ryan score in the first early. But even in those two periods, I didn't no. feel like Calgary was playing a great game. They, were, they weren't they no. were playing the and way they frankly, had all season. Frankly, the Flames didn't really play their game for more than like five minutes at a time and only a couple of times in any of the games. Yeah, and I think, especially in this game, too, we saw the Flames really, I think, take their foot off the gas at the end of the third. I think the last five minutes of the third period and that whole overtime, the Flames yeah, just looked like they stopped was... carrying. I don't know if it was carrying or running out of gas, but they just they were totally different than what they were for the, yeah, the and game they before that. They just didn't, they were completely lifeless at that point. And with that, that was four games. And then finally, the series came back to Calgary on April 19th for a game here in the Sea of Red and hoping the Flames could recapture the series. And this did not look like Calgary Flames hockey. They were lifeless. They were not going anywhere. 
Um, looked like they didn't care if they would have played with as much passion as the Sea of Red showed for this game. They would have won 5-1, to one, but instead lost 5-1 against the Colorado Avalanche in the Dome to put the nail in the coffin. Again, not a great game here. Not really much of anything that we can no, look at as a positive, at all. I don't think. Frankly, there was no positives at all from this entire series. And frankly, I think that this playoff series was the most embarrassing playoff series in the entire franchise's history. After Game 5, um, I was thinking to myself, wow, if this is what the best team in the West looks like, what did the worst team in the best yeah. in the West look like? Like, you know, these guys went from playing a very certain type of game to getting into the playoffs, and even in Game 5, like... Johnny had a penalty shot, missed it. He had a great chance after that, missed it. Like they just weren't executing on anything. And I'm looking at going, yeah, is this that's playoffs or more of the style that the Flames were playing throughout the series? It looked like a preseason game on the one side, and a team that's just coming out of going to the Stanley Cup Finals on the other end, where like the other team was prepared and ready to go and hustling and physical. And Calgary was like, oh, well, it's just, you know, we're out for a skate today. And, you know, that that's on appearance as a fan, that's what it looked like. It's just that it was excellent coaching by Bednar for Colorado. Uh, they completely interrupted everything that the Flames were doing. And none of the Flames players stepped up. Looking back at games three, four, and going into game five, I hope they'd fix this. But the same things I've been mentioning for a long time. No man in front. Like game four, they they had all their forwards sometimes behind the net trying to get a loose puck. And then it was loose. They had to shovel it back to the blue line and often didn't get it there. So Colorado would intercept it. Game five, we saw the same. Nobody in front of the net. Um, it was just it yeah, was sloppy hockey team, all the way around. It's literally as if they forgot how – like it – it almost looked like you combined 20 players who had never played a game with any of the other players and said, okay, go play. And well, I, I hate to say this. I've seen better structured hockey from those little Timbits Frankly, kids. at times I agree. Like that when they were playing their game, that's the few times that the flames had any pressure at all. But uh, you just simply can't win any games if your team's best players are basically playing like marginal AHL talent. You know, and I guess to, I think for all of us, if we were in the opposite position, if we were in the Colorado position, oh no, I don't think we'd be uh, well, so upset. We... But coming in with an 82 game season, 50 wins, 25 losses, number one in the West, 107 points. Well, you look we at the, that. the Flames had this similar type of a playoff series back in 06 07 against the Detroit Red Wings. Calgary was the eighth seed, Detroit was the number one. And in each game, Detroit had like 50 shots. And the only reason why it went to game six was because Mika Kiprasov was in his god mode and. We were one crossbar away from making it go to seven. And, you know, we could have actually won that series possibly. And all based off a of kipper. And, like, that was the level of shellacking that the flame. And, frankly, that series, the team played better as a whole than this series against Colorado. And, like, there's just no excuse for any player on this Flames team. And,. Frankly, I'm actually, in a way, I'm actually more pleased that this playoffs went this way than if, say, they went into the next round and got thumped by Vegas or San Jose. Uh, there's that, no man? veneer of, oh, well, we got a little further into the playoffs than... the. Yeah, like there's no veneer success. of any redeeming quality at all about this playoff series. And you now have to take a hard look at everybody and evaluate everybody on an intellectual basis instead of, a, oh, well, we did play relatively well in the first round and we just ran into a very good Vegas or San Jose team. 
Like this was in like honestly, I don't see Colorado winning more than a game against Vegas, and maybe they might push it to six against San Jose. And like I don't see them winning that series at all, and they shouldn't have won this one. And like I said to you before when we were previewing this series that the only way that Colorado wins this series is if the Flames beat themselves and the Flames made it so easy for Colorado that they beat themselves because they put up nothing no effort no cohesion no nothing like honestly the Ottawa Senators would have beat the Flames in that playoff series well, and it's so I, – I can't remember the last time that we've seen – I mean, we, we won't talk about Tampa. That's not what the show's about. But the first time that we've had both the first seeds in the East and the West out in the first round, but also the last time we've seen such a transformation of a team who was so dominant in the regular season. I mean, this is the second best year this franchise ever had. Yeah. To just like not it, show it, it for the playoffs. It's not like you can hang it out on – like a couple of years ago in that sweep against Anaheim where the Flames were the better team in each of the four games, but Elliot was just a tire fire in that. It was kind of the opposite. Everybody was bad, but the goalie. Yeah, exactly. Like, frankly, games two, three, four, and five could have been approaching or into double digits, if not for Smith. And like, it's just pathetic, frankly. Like I've never seen a playoff team, that bad and i've been watching hockey since 1990 and i've not yet seen any series any team play as badly as the flames did yeah no you're right it's and we have very few excuses this time i mean it's not like in the past like you've said oh we had a good goalie or oh we had you know a good first line or like colorado they have one line we had i mean if you look at the way this team was built and operate all year we had depth pretty much from the top to the bottom. And for all of them to crap out at the same time, it's unheard of. Yeah, it's not like, like it was just, oh, Johnny and Monty and Lindy weren't scoring. Everyone else was. Nobody was doing a good job. No, like Sam Bennett was the only player that I view as being above criticism. And because he played his game at the peak of his abilities currently throughout each of the five games and he didn't have a bad game out of any of them no it's and, just, we, and we've been and waiting it, all year for smitty to come together and he finally did yeah and smith had a good series as well and it's just frustrating because it like honestly like those were the worst games that i've seen giordano play all season hannafin play all season hammonick play all season like, honestly, the two best defensemen that the Flames had in that playoff series were Valimaki and Anderson. The young guys. Yeah. So I guess, you know, trying to make sense of what's happened, and I think we're all trying to do that now. If we look back, we can't just say that the team ran out of gas. We can't just say that, you know, these there's too many rookies on this team because the rookies are some of the better guys. I have a couple of things I want to run by you um, and see what you think as I'm trying to sort of process this. Coming into the series, we'd said, you know what, a lot of these guys don't have playoff experience. But looking at this team and this lineup and the way this team was put together, do you think that Goudreau, Monaghan, and Lindholm are really fit to be a first line for deep playoff team after what we've seen of them together for a year? I know a lot of people have been jumping on Monaghan, but uh, it came out today that he was uh, playing with a cracked thumb, which... I haven't personally had that particular injury, but I've known people that have had that injury that while playing hockey, and they say it's virtually impossible to hold the stick properly, let alone shoot or pass the puck. So for him to have been as bad as he was down the stretch and into the playoffs, it makes sense. But at the same and, time, if he's... I mean, he was really hurt last year. He was really hurt this year. Can you rely on your first-line center if he's getting hurt so much and those hands are going to give up eventually? It was wrist and hand last year. Or is this a guy you say, you know what, he's good enough, but he's a second-line center and we got to go find someone more reliable? Well, the fl that's another thing, though, is that the Flames... You look at Michael Backlund, and Michael Backlund is a very good player. But if you're structured properly... He should not be any more than your third line center. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's on the second line and he's doing an adequate job there, but he's not a second line center. 
and the Flames need a second line center. And that's not to say that you couldn't put that second line guy with Gaudreau and make it your default first line. But the Flames need a secondary option in case a Monaghan gets hurt that you can throw someone else with Gaudreau. Because like, you can't throw Jankowski or Derek Ryan uh, up on the first line because it, it just doesn't work. Like You need somebody who can actually play at Gaudreau's level even to a close extent. Sort of like Chicago having Anisimov with Patrick Kane. Where, you know, like Anisimov's no, not really a first-line center, but he's a decent second-line guy. And that's what the Flames need to go out and get, is a second-line center. Just so that way they have some flexibility in their lineup. So that way you can have Monaghan... Like, if he does get hurt, you can either sit him... Because, like, realistically, the Flames should have sat Monaghan with it, that injury. And if we have to play Vegas in the first round, so be it instead. And let him get healthy, but that didn't happen. And because of the fact that there is no replacement for Monaghan in the organization. And even him playing at 70% is better than any of the other options and the flames need to get someone else to be able to spell uh monahan if he gets hurt where you can actually sit him and not be going okay which fourth liner we do we put on the first line because we have nobody else well i mean and not saying it's ideal but this year looking at the lineup if it were me i probably would have gone goudreau bennett down the middle and lindholm on the right side, but I'm, I know Lindholm had a great year too, but he didn't look good. And I'm wondering if these three guys together, they all look like they maybe don't have what it takes to be a good playoff line. And if they need to be separated and other players put in there. Yeah. And like, that's why I think that the flames in the off season, their first priority and second priority is getting two top six forwards, one right winger, one center, and they can be a second line player. Like it doesn't need to be another star type player. If you can get one, hey, awesome! Like if you can go get Taylor Hall, hey, that's perfect. But if it's someone who's just more of a decent second line guy, like a Nazim Kadri or something like that, you go, okay, that that would work, and you just figure out all the details around those two guys. Yeah, I think I don't know. I'm I'm not sold that Monahan going forward, especially with his injury troubles, is the guy that we need on the first line. I think he's got to move to line two and then build two strong scoring lines. Yeah, and that's where it's gonna be at a bit of an adventure to find that center that can like we basically need to find someone like a Lindholm who might not have had the right opportunity and, you know, might be just like a 40-point guy around the league and deal something for that player and try and get him to be the first-line center. Because Monaghan and Kachuk, when they've played together, have played rather well in the past. So if the Flames could make, like, two first lines, that would go a long way to making things better. For sure. And I think, I think you're right about that. Is it doesn't need to be a star guy. We don't need to go out and get someone's, you know, really top line, you know, like a Huberdo or Patrice Bergeron or someone like that who's going to cost a lot. We need to find that under the radar guy, the guy like Lindholm who is not quite there, but who we think we can bring up and, you know, give a, an opportunity to. And I don't think they need to be great. If you're playing with Goudreau, you need to be good enough. But you don't need to bring in Tyler Sagan or someone like that to... And, you know, like, if you can, awesome. You know, like, it, that's not to say, like, if the price is right that you don't go out and get a top-line guy. But it's one of those things where it just depends on the acquisition cost. And if the Flames can go and get someone to fill that role for cheap enough, it's just like that Mark Stone trade. Like, it, I know some fans were criticizing because, oh, well, we would have made the second round had we got Stone. But 
Yusuf Valimaki, even though he played just the last couple of games, he was the Flames, in my opinion, best defenseman in this postseason. And he's looking like he's going to be a top-pairing defenseman for the next 10 years. Yeah, I agree. So that, to me, is more important than some first-line right-winger. Well, and, the and, big, and I think the big deal we have to remember when we're getting a center or a winger is salary cap, right? If we want to bring that guy in, he's got to fit in under the cap. And you can't be bringing in a $10 million Mark Stone. That's not going to work. No, and that's why the Flames need to find someone who fits the payroll parameters while upgrading the team. And I think it may... Just because it might be easier to acquire, I think you might end up seeing an older guy brought in to fill that for a year or two as a stopgap. I think it's somebody like a Ryan Getzlaff type who's older, but their team might be wanting to shed some salary until they can find something better. Yeah, and that's where like acquisition cost comes into mm -hmm. things. Like If you get Getzlaff for relatively cheap, then you go, okay, sure, yeah, awesome, great. I'm you know, just... But just looking around yeah. the league at some different centers I think might fit that bill. I mean, I've heard some people say, oh, we should try to trade for, like, Couturier. Well, that's going to be expensive. You know, you're yeah. not... Yeah, he's their good drill. Like, it's going to cost a lot. Like, yeah. you're talking Monaghan plus, probably, for Couturier. But looking around the league at some guys, I think, you know, you're going to have to pay to get anybody that's that good. Don't get me wrong. There's going to be a high acquisition cost. But tell me what you think of some of these names, Matt. Um, if we if we look at the Detroit Red Wings r roster, what would you think about an, and an Andreas and Anthony Sayu? Oh, he's one of my favorite players, and yeah, uh, I really like Anthony Sayu, and it would cost a lot though, and I don't see he also has a bit of a problem in that he's not an overly creative player with his puck handling. He's just so ridiculously fast that he generates a lot yep. of chances just because... But I think on that first line, we're looking for someone really fast. Yeah, true enough, but I don't know... Like, th I think that the cost to get him would be absurdly high, and I don't know if the Flames are you, willing to pay that. You could be right. What about a guy like Kyle Taurus? Adequate. You know, I, if you got him to be the second-line center, it'd be like, yeah, okay... That works, you mm -hmm. know. Not he's not gonna wow you, but but I, again, I think if you've got a strong center down the middle, he's kind of got to be the anchor for the two dynamic wingers. Let's say on the yeah. first line, which is let's say Goudreau Lindholm. Yeah, like that would be fine. There's no problem with that. It's just it's kind of like having two Monahans. They're both kind of boring players. They just do their job well. But they're not, like, super exciting or inspiring or anything like that. Um, looking at some other teams here, what about Shen or Bozak out of St. Louis? Tyler Bozak? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 think, uh, I think Braden Shen could come in and could anchor the first line if needed. I think Bozak comes in as your second line center. Yeah, I... I don't think that St. Louis would be really wanting to trade them, but that'd be okay. I, I don't really... I'm just, I just think if, if St. Louis goes deep, I think they're going to have a lot of deals that need to be redone, and they're going to be looking to stock up, and I think they might have yeah. to. Like I, honestly, with Bozak, I don't see him being better than Backlund. So, like, no. it's it kind of like just... You're keeping back... You know, the objective is to move Backlund down to the third line, so, I don't see that with Bozak at all. But, uh, Shen, I think the cost would be too much. Another guy that I think you might be able to get, because I think Winnipeg is going to be trying to make some moves just to make moves, would be Brian Little. Yeah. That'd be okay. I I could see them doing that one. Um, But anyway, some moves that probably need to be made there is bringing in, like you said, some you know, some top six forwards. Um, something I've mentioned on the show before, and I haven't mentioned it in a while, but I think at some point we have to look at moving Johnny Goudreau. And is he really still the guy we need as our top line winger? And I think this year you're going to see Kachuk brought in and, or, you know, brought in again and a new contract with a much higher salary. 
And is it time to maybe look at making him the top line no. winger with the progression we've seen and moving Goudreau no. on? You don't think it's no. time yet? Why not? It, Goudreau's one of the few dynamic players on this team. If we trade him, then the Flames might as well just tank it and rebuild. I don't know if I'd go that far. I think it depends what you're going to get for him. You could get pretty much anything you want from Goudreau, and you could make a deal with, I think you'd want to go to somewhere like a New Jersey or a Philly. I think you could get some pretty good pieces back. I don't think it's time yet. I want to see what Kachuk can do next year, but I think this time next year, we might be talking about it being time to do that if Kachuk can take the steps. It depends a lot on like the parameters of uh how like next season and beyond go but like it, frankly it would have to be something that blows the flames away or like it, i could see possibly with a team like tampa bay just because Gaudreau has uh, cost certainty with his contract and a guy like say Braden point might you know if you're going to flip him a guy like Point would be what you'd get back, but the Flames would also have to pay that player an extra like $3 million to basically be the same player. So it's kind of pointless to me. Yeah, I can't see him going to Tampa because with Stamp goes there, they're not going to want Goudreau as a number two. No, but you'd just switch one of them over. Yeah, I could see, I mean... I can see Philadelphia at some point moving Giroux, and I could see them bringing uh, Goudreau in because that's an area he likes as well. But I don't think this year is the time to do it. I think that I, I don't want to wait as long as we did with Iggy and get spare parts that never amount to anything, but I think we have to give him at least one more year um, with Kachuk sort of you know taking strides every year. I think it's going to happen, but this isn't the time for it to happen. I think the soonest that you'd see a Goudreau trade would be at, in the last year of his dead uh, of his contract. Yeah, I, think so. I don't. He's too good of a value for what he's getting paid. Like realistically, he should be getting paid ten million a year, and he's getting so. Which would be the that would be after next season twenty well, uh, twenty 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 one. So yeah, after next season would be that time yeah. then. And that would because there's three years yeah. left. So I don't see it until then at the earliest, and I think that the Flames will probably just want to re-sign him after that anyway. So I, I'm not, like, how would you say, like, with the playoffs, how it w happened, I'm not apocalyptic about this team where, like, let's... No, me neither. Yeah, you know, like, you might see another Dougie Hamilton-esque trade where someone who is a high-quality asset might get traded for other high quality assets um like say you know like i'm not saying this but in terms of get rid of him but like if you were to say trade monahan for a couple other guys who you know basically recapture that structure of the the uh, hamilton trade where we're getting two parts f that are quote unquote lesser for Monahan, but I don't see I don't well and unless unless they can bring in a better center, I think Monahan has to be yeah, here next I year. I know, I'm not saying to trade Monahan specifically. I'm just throwing his name in there as a yeah. that thought of you know and, and and I'm not trying to be apocalyptic when I say move Goudreau. It's not that I'm saying let's get rid of him, he's no good. It's he has value and at some point we need I mean you know, every uh, every player is an asset. And at some point, you have to ask, is it time to cash in that asset? I don't think it is yet. I don't think Goudreau retires a flame. I think he will end up getting moved at some point. And I hope it's a time when we can get value for him. But I think you got to keep him around for at least one more yeah. year. Well, he's the only player in the organization, really, that has a higher level talent. So that's why I'm not really enthusiastic about dealing him like everybody else we have a lot of skilled players but there's no like how would you say hall of fame caliber skill with any of them and like he's the only guy in the organization that has that so i'm very reticent to see him moving anywhere yeah no it's not time yet 
Um, so Matt, I mean, you know, we could sit here and dwell all night on the negatives, but I think people have been doing that all weekend. Um, what are some of the positives that we can take away from this season in this playoff run? I'll start with one. I think that Calgary did a good job for the first time in a while of infusing youth into this roster. We saw, you know, Mangiapani, we saw Anderson, we saw Valamaki, we saw Shillington, even a guy like Hannafin, who's, you know, just turned 22, um, brought into this team. At one point, Dubé came in and... They all played really well. There's not a, a you know a guy here that we can say they're not doing well. And I, I think that that was one of the things they did well was bringing the right guys in to you know from the farm to fill those spots. And I think all the guys I mentioned, they've all developed this year. I mean, look at Anderson, who's playing on the top pairing. I think we had a great year to figure out what we've got and what we don't and know, you know, is our youth ready to fill some spots? Yeah, and we saw with each of those players that they are. And, like, Andrew Mangiapane looks like he's turning into more of a third-line, possibly a second-line guy down the road. Uh, Dubé, he looks like he's an NHL player, just he needs a little bit more time. Uh, Valimaki and Anderson look like the first pairing to be, and Shillington looks at least to be an NHL player of some sort. So that, and same with Hannafin. So, frankly, like in, I think in like three years that the left side of the Flames defense goes Valimaki, Hannafin, and Shillington. But, you know, it's one of those where we just have to wait and see. Like, you know, like you look at a guy like David Riddick, who I also consider a prospect. He was hurt for the second half of this season, so it's hard to t determine if the first half of the season guy that we saw was who Riddick is, and is he going to be a starter for the long term, or is he just gonna trail off a bit? And like, there, that's pretty much the only question mark I have with any of the young players, really. Yeah, I, I mean, those, and I think that if you're management at this point, and as you and I were mentioning, you want to bring something in, I think you can ask some hard questions about what veterans, I don't want to say become expendable, but what veterans do you feel you could comfortably move now knowing these young guys have established themselves as NHL players? And I think you'll see some moves if for no other reason than that of, okay, we know we've got, say, a guy like Anderson, who's an NHL, an everyday NHLer. Who can we move, you know, to TJ get Brody. a different asset? Well, yeah, that's definitely one. I think, you know, a guy like Stone yeah. potentially. Um, you know, even on the front end, I think there's some guys that yeah. maybe we can say, okay, someone else has shown you know, where they are. Jankowski, Froelich, Neil. Potentially. Yeah. And we have to remember, too, most of these guys did not make the team out of camp. Like Anderson, uh, Shillington, um, Mangiapani, none of them made the team out of camp. So it's even more impressive, I think, that these guys fought their way up and, you know, stayed here when they got the opportunity. Yep. Any other pros? I mean, it was a great season, well put together roster. I think this is probably the best top to bottom Flames roster I can remember since, you know, the, the Stanley Cup run, it's it was a great roster top to bottom. What are the pros have we got this season? Well, Matt? the way I've always looked at the regular season is that it separates the truly talented teams from the not-so-talented teams. And the Flames were first, and legitimately so. They had the most raw talent of any team in the West. They just the playoff separates who has heart and who doesn't, and that's where the Flames kind of ran into some problems. So, um, you know, Colorado wanted it more, and we lost. And so, like, there is a lot of positives. The Flames do have a lot of talent throughout their lineup and throughout the organization. And, you know, that's one of the things that, like, people you can't get overly frustrated. Like, I know it's a piss off that the flames got eliminated in five games but just because they messed up and didn't go anywhere you didn't just magically vanish very talented players off of the roster permanently you can also make trades like the hamilton one switching parts for other parts that you need to make this team better not only for the regular season but for the postseason and 
that's where the Flames... And that's why I said earlier that I think it's better that they lost in the first round and in the manner that they did instead of having a little bit more success and still getting thumped just because of the fact that it's clear-cut that there needs to be changes. And and I think, too, it showed us right away very distinctly who's a, a contributor and who's a hanger-on. Yeah. You know, you and I won't sit here and argue officiating. There's no oh, use no. for that. We'll let other people do that on Twitter and other places. But the Calgary Flames didn't play well. Nobody really played well. And, you know, we won't debate why that is. But I think there was definitely some separation between those that were doing something and those that yeah, weren't. Yeah, exactly. And, like, the Flames' best line throughout the postseason was the Ryan Hathaway and Manchapani line. And, you know, like, they were good. For most of it, they kind of were not as noticeable as the series went on. But, you know, like there, some players showed up, others didn't. And, you know, there are certain excuses like Monaghan with his thumb that you go, okay, yeah, sure, that makes sense. But this team needs to grow and learn, anyone who's remaining on the team anyway. And take lessons from this that you actually have to be prepared for game one. And like, I think that you'll see both Tampa and Calgary have significantly better playoffs next season. But, uh, yeah, it, I, I also, I think Tampa was built to win the East. I don't think coming into this, we, any of us realistically expected Calgary to win the whole West. And I think that it gives us some lessons that this team played above their head for, I'll call it 65 games, but there's still some work to do if you really want to be a contender. Yeah, and it's not easy winning the Stanley Cup. And you have to have everything kind of go right properly at the right times. And the Flames peaked early, at, you know, before the All-Star break. Like, they were just awesome, and then... And once again, they fizzled after the bye week. Yeah, and... The Flames need to figure out how to be good for 82 games and then into the playoffs. And and this is why I was saying earlier, I don't think it's time to move Goudreau or Monaghan or any of those guys. Give them one more year. If they again fizzle at the 68 game mark in our second, you know, second time making a serious run at things, I think maybe, you know, hey, these guys aren't 82 game players. But yeah, yeah, you know, that's when you do you've, you've more gotta, like retooling surgery on the team to get things going properly but. yeah and and if and if we see them both kind of disappear after the break again for the third year in a row then maybe it's hey we need to make some some tr bigger drastic changes Yeah, exactly and then at that point like if we have the same storyline again next season then yeah it, basically anybody that's a top tier player on this team can go <laughs> Yeah, I mean, last year, Monaghan, Goudreau, the whole team failed to show up to play after the break. This year, they sh didn't show up, and then they came again at the end of the season to play. Um, I think if we see three times in a row, then, all right, maybe you're not a Calgary Flame. Let's move you somewhere yeah. else. Um, one, thing, one thing I think, too, we can look at here as a positive is, and we talked about some of the players earlier who emerged. I think the goaltending. We came into the season not quite sure about goaltending. We came in, I mean, you know, you and I not sure about Mike Smith, about David Riddick. And I think for the first time in a long time, we can say, I don't want to say Calgary's goaltending saved them because a lot of nights it was adequate enough while the rest of the team was playing great. But for the first time in a long time, we didn't have goaltending that worried us. We had competent enough goals. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh like, it wasn't a kipper season where we were jumping on the back of our goalie to take us all the way, but we weren't having, you know, Elliot and Ramo and some of these guys or, that seem like they yeah, should be capable. Or, like, pre-December Mike Smith. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that the team was... I give the coaching staff credit for knowing when it was time to pull the plug on Mike Smith early and giving David Riddick some time, but I think that, our you know, for the first time in a while, we've used two goaltenders. I can't remember the last time... You know, the Flames had two competent goalies. Yeah, well, it was the first season in franchise history where the Flames had two goalies win 20 games. There you go. 
So, you know, quite quite an achievement for our franchise, at least. Usually we've had Kipper and, you know, some unknown backup, or we had two guys who were somewhat okay. But, you know, even in years when on paper we should have had two good goalies, like even when Eddie Lack was here a couple of years ago, on paper he should have been a competent backup and something didn't work out. So I think for the first time, both goalies that look good on paper were good yeah. enough. And I don't view goaltending as a strength for the team by any stretch, but it wasn't strength and it wasn't a weakness. Yeah. And like moving forward, that will be one of the larger questions that the Flames have is what do they do for their goaltending next season? But that's still remains to be seen. So Matt, based on what we were discussing earlier, I've been sitting here coming up with a lineup for the Flames next year. Can I run this by you? Yeah. So I think that on the forward ranks, we're going to see, um, I think Bennett gets moved out this year. I think he's an asset that is movable. I don't think they want to, but you might have to move him. And I think Froelich gets moved out. Um, yeah, I agree. I also think, uh, I disagree with you on Sam Bennett, but I think that Mark Jankowski is not going to be on the team next year. And I, and this sounds weird, but if... I would be somewhat shocked if James Neal is back. See, Neal's going to be a weird one. I don't think they want to buy him out this year. Um, it's one of those things where I think that, like, unless he changes his game where, like, he's playing at an NHL level, uh, you know, like, he might have been dealing with injuries all season or, like, there was something clearly wrong with, like, he just vanished. Like, that wasn't the player that we were expecting at all. And, like, I think that either the Flames have to trade him uh, for some other similar bad contract, or they might have to even look at buying him out. I don't think they're going to buy him out. And we've seen them be pretty forgiving with some of their bad contracts, like Brower in the past. I think, you know, you got to give him at least one more year to come back next year, give him the first 20 games and see what he can do. Um, before you say wave them or do or try to trade them, but I don't see anyone who's going to want to take that deal. And why take someone else's bad deal when we've got our own? Yeah. If nothing else, I mean, make Neil your you know move him to the third or fourth line and just play him there. I think he came in and the expectation was he'd be a first line player here. He was supposed to be in a lot of people's depth charts above Lindholm, and he wasn't. And maybe it's just play him on the fourth line until we figure out what to do with them. I think strategically, the Flames would like to keep him around next year to dangle him to Seattle in the expansion draft. Yeah. Um, Well, I'm hoping that he bounces back. Like, you know, I still like James Neal as a player. It's just that what we saw this year was not James Neal at all. And, like, you know, that player, honestly, that we saw, like, if we see that again next year, I would, I'd give him 10 games. And, like, if, you know, like, Treat him like a rookie, and you know, like uh, the you know how they draft players and throw him in for your nine ten game audition. If he plays well enough, he sticks. Otherwise, make him the thirteenth forward and see him maybe five times the rest of the way. I mean, he's an NHL. He's an NHL veteran who's thirty one. He shouldn't be that much over the hill yet. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, you know what? If you look at Hamannick last year, he didn't look great, and this year in his second year with the team, when he's more comfortable, he's looking a lot better. So maybe it's just he needs some time to get used to the team. Yeah, the I, city, I the agree. new system. Yeah. And if that's the case and he plays well, great. If not, then I just don't think you're going to find someone to take him this summer. No. Um, but we'll we'll see what happens. But anyway, let's assume. All right, let me do two two versions of the scenario. Let's assume that Bennett is here first. I yeah. think first line then becomes Goudreau, some other center that gets acquired, and Jason Zucker, who I think we get in the Froelich deal that you and I talked about the deadline. I think it'll be Froelich in our first for Zucker. Yeah, I um, I think it'll be a second actually. But okay, either way, yeah. Froelich and a pick for Zucker. Yeah. Um, I think second line then becomes Kachuk, Monahan, Lindholm, spreading out some of that scoring. If you've got good Goudreau and Zucker on line one and Kachuk and Monahan on line two, I think then the third line becomes Bennett. I think Janko will be here for for at least the off season and Neil on your third line and Manjipani Ryan Hathaway is your fourth. Well, uh, you're deleting Backlund off the roster. I did, and this is the thing that I I wanted to. I want to talk to you about in order. I think if Janko goes, Bennett's here, 
But I think if you spend a lot of money on a first line center, you then have to wonder if you really want to spend five and a half million on your third line center. I think if they break the bank to bring in a top center, they might have to move backland to recoup even a goaltending asset of some kind or some picks. Yeah. Uh, just cap wise. I, not that I want to see him go, but when I'm looking at it money wise, this team can't afford to do five and a half million on a third center. Yeah. Especially they can. when they got Neil there. Yeah, they can. If you get rid of, that's where like that, why I wouldn't be adverse to the flames buying out James Neal. Cause they'd save nearly $4 million on the cap for each of the if next they get four rid of seasons. Neil. Yeah. If you get rid of Neil, you could do it. If you don't get rid of Neil, which I don't think they will. Yeah. Well, that's why like, uh, I'm actually kind of leaning into the, just buy Neil out entirely and just get rid of rid of him at this point. That's how, you know, just eat the $2 million cap hit for eight years and just, get him off the team it's a long penalty yeah well maybe that might teach the management not to buy ufas that are slow you know that it but bit them with brower bit them with neil tree almost needs to just not go winger shopping on july 1st yeah um and then on the back end i think brody will be out of here and i can see there being a, a package of either brody and janko or brody and bennett to upgrade either your first line center or to bring in a top goaltender. I what I'm kind of thinking is that Brody plus Jankowski for that second line center guy, whomever that is, you know, cuz I think Monahan and that guy will basically be interchangeable on the roster and a lot of teams need defense and Brody is fairly good. Yeah. So you know, and do you think what do you think they do with the stone contract? That's another four million that we got to figure out what, or three and a half million to figure out what to do with. Uh, a lot of teams could use him. Uh, you know, it's one of those things. Just because Calgary happened to have three good young rookies come up, doesn't mean the other pieces are bad. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like Stone is a NHL defenseman on thirty-one teams. It's I don't think like, you get another NHL asset for Stone, but I think no, it's a great uh, way to recoup a pick. Yeah, I'm. I'd be expecting like a third or a fourth. Yeah, or I mean fifth, we have no like second that. and no sixth, but I could see us getting a like a third and recoup that sixth. Yeah, something like that. But yeah, I think I'm expecting that to be just a pick trade, and you know, there's plenty of teams like Stone. Honestly, like on Edmonton is a top four defenseman, and there's mm -hmm. a whole, you could go through like a, about a half dozen to a dozen teams where Stone's a top four defenseman. It's true. So, you know, it's as Calgary, you know, there's a reason why they were the best team in the West. Yeah. They have like 10 NHL defensemen and, you know, Stone's just on the lower end of that. And that's not his fault. It's just that we're good. Yeah. I, and, I, so I think if we assume Backlund will be here, then we have Goudreau, some other center and Zucker, Kachuk, Monaghan, Lindholm, Bennett, Backlund, and let's say Neil, just because you got to have a place to put him. And then the Ford line is Manjapani, Ryan Hathaway. The only thing that doesn't give you is a place to put Dubé. And that's where I, if you buy Neil out, that's where I'd stick Dubé. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Could be. Not that I want to get rid of Bennett, but I think that, again, there's value in the piece. And I could see the Flames moving it for the value. Yeah, and that's what why I'm reticent to trade him is because he was the only guy who actually showed up yeah. above the fourth line in the playoffs and he's been good each of the playoffs that we've played so i'm reticent to see him getting moved just because he's one of the actual mm -hmm. few good things with this team in the postseason okay let me put it this way if we compare him in a way to furland and that he's sort of the gritty guy who made it to the first line and probably shouldn't have been there but he had the compete level and the drive to do it and arguably we move furland for a much better asset from if the, the Flames were to be able to get the equivalent of Lindholm in a deal with Bennett, sure. Like, you know, like if you don't you move him for a pick, you got to move him for a roster player. Yeah, you know, it's just like if you were to trade Lindholm for Kucherov, you'd be going, yeah, sure, duh. But it just, it would depend on. But remember, Lindholm, Lindholm now and Lindholm when we acquired him were two different assets. True. And that that's one of those things where you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do that same deal now this off season. No, but it just depends on 
what you're you know it's just like any trade like you know to me like the only guy that's not tradable is kachuk just because he has that element that's weird mm -hmm. and everybody else though it's does the trade make sense for what you're trying to do and are you getting a good deal out of it yeah and like i'm not opposed to trading anybody off this team like it it doesn't matter it it just depends on is that player that you're getting better to get us to the end goal of winning the Stanley Cup. And if that's the case, then great, yeah. go for it. And I think, you know, we have to look at for next year, not necessarily today, but the Flames management have to look at spreading that scoring out. It, when you look at it, we have a very deep roster, but most of the scoring still came from one line, just like in Colorado. And I think we've learned... You've got to spread that out. And I think, too, the Flames have to look at more guys like um, Bennett, guys that can be nasty, guys that can get in their face. We didn't see as much of that from Kachuk in the second half of the season, but if we get more guys like Kachuk and Bennett, I think you're going to last a lot longer in the playoffs. Yeah, the Flames, the two main needs that they need to get are being faster overall and players that have a nastier edge to them. Because you look at guys like Monaghan and Jankowski, they're good NHL players, but they don't have that gear of being nasty or physical or anything like that. They just, it's not a part of them. Mm -hmm. And you need to swap that out for something else where, you know, like all of the very passive guys you know you can handle Gaudreau being passive but like even Manjapane he throws hits even though he's short and he engages physically so like it it just the Flames need less passive guys and more engaged players and I think that you're never you're not going to find many that do both like a, a Kachuk so I think that we need to sprinkle throughout the lineup some of those sort of, I don't even want to say engage, but some of the guys that are willing to get physically involved on each line. Yeah. You need to let them do their job and make way for the scorers. Exactly. So, you know, I think, and I think these are, you know, we've definitely done a great job of, um, of building this roster, but it shows us there's lots to do. And I think this year, the big thing for the Flames we mentioned was youth movement. I think next year we have to bring in veterans. Like, I think we have the youth pieces we need now. If we're making deals, it's got to be for playoff ready and playoff tested veterans. Yeah. The ideal age range would be anywhere from 25 to 28. Mm -hmm. I think. And, well, and I think even younger, if you can get a guy like a oh, sure. who's been to the playoffs, but you know, we made a deal with Carolina who's not a playoff team. I think we need to bring guys in who on their record have at least one or two, you know, playoff appearances. Yeah, I agree. Um, or let's say rounds of playoff appearance. Not just one or two games, but have been there for a season or two. Yep. Um, so with that in mind, um, who stays and who goes? Trades aside, why don't we run through this list of UFAs and talk about who we think the Flames uh, may keep or let go of. Okay. And if we think we're going to keep them, what kind of deal they might get. Uh, the first one is Garnet Hathaway. Uh, one of my favorite players. I would keep him three years, one and a half per. I don't think you can go any higher than one and a half. I'd be willing... Like, if the Flames went 1-7, I think that'd be fine. That'd be a little on the high side. I think but... you could find a free agent replacement if you want that... more than that. Yeah, uh... That if it was any more than one seven, I I think you'd look elsewhere. But he does a very good job. He's a decent fourth liner, and he had I think eleven goals this season. He does everything that you want from a fourth liner. So him getting one and a half, one seven, even if it was a shorter deal at two million, like say one year two million, that'd be fine. But Again, I think at two million, I'd rather go out and see what we can get July first. Yeah, I agree. But you know, if that's what it ended up being, you're like, yeah, okay. It's only for one year, so who cares? Yeah, then I think you get into Lance Boma territory. You got to be careful. True enough. Speaking but, of Boma, yeah. he finally comes off our books this year. Yay! We're still paying Boma. We're still paying Ryan Murphy, and we pay for four more years Troy Brower. Yay! 
Um, the next guy on the list is Dalton Prout. No need. I think up until the Fattenberg acquisition, I would have kept Prout. Now that we have Fattenberg, unless Dalton's willing to play in the AHL, you don't keep him. And even then, I think another team will grab him uh, before he'd be willing to say, yeah, I'll play in Stockton. Yeah, exactly. He's the kind of guy you bring in, you put him on waivers, and he gets claimed anyways. Yeah. Everybody needs veteran D, so I think that um, he won't be back. Next guy's Oliver Oscar Fantenberg. I'd like to keep him, but uh, you know, again, like if he he'd only be the number seven. So if the Flames signed him for one or two years at say a million bucks, awesome. he's making six fifty this year, which is what league minimum. Yeah, so you know, if he makes like uh, upwards of a million bucks, you're like, yeah, sure, okay. I think. I, I'd be okay to sign Fantenberg, but I'd also be okay to give Shillington that spot. And I think for me as a number seven, a million's a bit rich. Again, you could probably go to the free agent pool and grab somebody. I think if you, Fantenberg's willing to sign for less than 850, keep him around. Otherwise, I think sh- move Shillington in that spot. I'd prefer to keep Fantenberg um, and let Shillington play in Stockton for one more year. Um, just because I think for Shillington... Uh, more ice time will be better for his development. But uh, the fact that he was up here for so long, though, I'm not sure the team's ready to send him back to Stockton. Yeah, it just depends. And, like, uh, you know. Uh, I think Fattenberg's a good number six. I think we we got to try and hang on to him. But at the same time, being a number six or a number seven, the money has to make sense. And I can see him getting some looks because of his end-of-season performance. And I can see him getting some offers from other teams. And if we have to walk away from him because of that, I'm, uh, you know, he did well. We brought him in. He did well. We gave him nothing for him. He served his usefulness. If that's what it ends up being, that's fine. But, uh, you know, ideally we keep him. But it, at the end of the day, you're not going to be crying if he goes away. Um, on the list here, I have one RFA who I think might be an interesting one to talk about, and that's Curtis Lazar. Do you qualify him? You could. Uh, and decent farm hand, and that would be about it. He's making nine fifty right now, so to qualify him, you'd probably have to offer him. Was it usually ten percent more? So you're looking at yeah. about a million bucks. Why not? Yeah, he he just needs to get better, and you know, if the flames walk away, that's fine. It's either way, it, it is what it is, and. You know, they, I, I can I can see them not qualifying them, letting them go to UFA and then come back to him if nobody's made him an offer. Yeah, like I don't see the need to qualify him. I don't think he's going to be a hot player. No, I but, don't see him being an NHL player anyway. So I, I think let him go. See if anyone's interested. If not, talk to him again late yeah. July, early August, and say here's the deal we're willing to do. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then Tyler Grailvac, who we saw come in, uh, he played what one game? No, he didn't play any games here. Buddy Robinson did. Yeah, it's one of those where if he comes back, sure. An- another farmhand, I think he'll be back. Yeah, good veteran guy for the farm. Yeah. Um, and last but not least on this list, Mike Smith, the uh, UFA goaltender on our roster. Do you bring uh, Smitty back? Absolutely not. I think Smitty has earned himself an NHL backup job based on his playoff performance. I don't think he's earned himself an NHL backup job in Calgary. I don't want him back for one reason, and it has absolutely nothing to do with Mike Smith. What's that? He, well, it does, but it's not for him as a goaltender. It's his passing. And one of the things I noticed that, Colorado exploited in the playoffs was that the Flames defensemen stood around waiting for Smith to pass him the puck. And they were able to get in on those defensemen and it caused a lot of problems for the Flames to get outlook pass outlet passes going and any flow to their offensive game. And like yeah, the Flames are getting less wear and tear, but it also makes the team based off of how they were using Smith to it makes them easy to defend against and Colorado is easily able to exploit that and like you look at like normal puck defense uh retrieval the defenseman is skating hard to go get the puck he goes and gets the puck and 
car- usually will carry it around the net and look for the outlet pass from there. But with Smith, you have the guy kind of casually going into the corner area, waiting for Smith to pass the puck. Then he's got to stop, receive the puck, and then decide what to do. And by that time, that little herky-jerky delay there, the other team can get, if they have fast enough players like Colorado did, they are able to get in on the Flames' defense and cause havoc. And I think that that was the actual reason why the Flames lost that first round series and it had nothing to do with Smith, the goalie, because he was fantastic. It's the Flames just didn't, they don't utilize him properly. Like when Dallas had Marty Turco, um, the defenseman would often like cut in front of the net to receive the pass so that way they could go and like carry use their speed to carry on and go back out and they wouldn't just come and stop and that's why i wouldn't want smith to be back and i think think that that sort of turco smith puck moving defenseman is seen less and less in the league because it is a faster game now and you're seeing guys who can easily counter it yeah and like smith did a perfect job and like he should get a contract and i wouldn't even be shocked if he was a starter on some team it's just that the Flames need to go in a different direction just because they don't utilize them properly. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think he's done in Calgary. He's 37. I don't know many teams, unless it's somebody like Ottawa is just looking to fill a body in net who would bring him in as a starter. Um, I can see somebody... I can see some team who maybe has a hot back or a hot young guy who's been a backup and they're just looking for some veteran help to mentor the guy, bring him in. Um, I don't think before that playoff run, he would have even got a look uh, next year. I think he was done. And I think that playoff run probably gets him an NHL contract somewhere. Yeah. The place I'm expecting him to go actually is Philadelphia to back up Carter Hart. Interesting. Um, I could see him honestly also end up in Florida as a backup to Bobrovsky. Yeah, that could be veteran guy. Take a little bit of money, but at least, you know, he's there and he's ready. That sort of thing. Yeah, I could see that. So I, I, those are our UFAs. Uh, let's quickly run through the RFAs. I don't think there's any here that we will, uh, dispute. Sam Bennett has Arbrights this year. He's an RFA. I think they yeah. re-sign him. Yeah. And in the neighborhood of two ish, two and a quarter. He's making one point nine five now. I think probably two and a half is a reasonable price. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Kachuk, nine hundred fifty thousand. He's in for a big raise. I think you're looking about seven million so, there. Yeah, seven and a half. That's I kind of have seven and a half over six years. Uh, Andrew Mangiapane, seven hundred thousand right now. I think you bring him back. Definitely. And Alan Quine, you bring back. He's seven hundred thousand. Uh, maybe you know, just like Railback, it's like if he goes, okay. If not, yeah. You know, well, I mean, way. you you at least make him a qualifying offer as an RFA. True. Right. I mean, you can you can make it a two way for him. So send him to the farm. But you know, he looked good, Quine, when he was here this year. True. You know, and in that fill in role, you need those guys you can bring up from the farm and trust to be able to get the job done. Yeah. True enough. And I I think Quine played well enough that. He's earned another year here in the Flames organization. He did what he needed to do as a call up, and yep. you, you know you can't. You at least qualify him if you. I mean, if he arbs out and he's too high as an arb, let him go. But um, you know, you at least qualify him. Yep. And then uh, David Riddick. Obviously, I think he gets two and a half. The one guy that is currently on the roster that I don't think will be back is John Gillies. I actually am kind of penciling him in as a trade piece. See, I'm thinking it'll probably be like Brody and Gillies for something or yeah, uh, Janko and Gillies for something. There's a lot of teams that need a young goalie, and I think that there's still value there. Well, that's there. What, uh, like what we were discussing previously with Zucker and Dubnik, uh, at, like expanding that deal, and I think that you would see uh, Gillies included in that kind of a deal. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he gets flipped for a pick, but I think he becomes the Adam Fox, the piece we throw in, you know, like in last year's deal to make somebody want to take it. Yeah, because, like, if you look at Minnesota, they're rebuilding and they don't really have a high-quality goalie prospect coming up. So getting a Gillies wouldn't hurt. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of teams that would like a Gillies. Um, yeah. You know, and again, maybe not your best player you've ever had, but uh, or your best goalie you even have now. But you know, a guy that you could say, yeah, we can probably do something with this piece, even if he's starting in the A for another year or two. Yeah. So Matt, if if Mike Smith is leaving, um, I don't know if you see David Riddick as a starting goaltender or not, but you're going to need some goaltender in the team, whether that's Tyler Parsons being brought up or McDonald or uh, Schneider being brought up, or you go free agent shopping. First oh, off, you also he, have Zagadulin, so you know. That's... Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think he jumps right to the NHL though. True. I'm penciling him in as a as an AHL player. I think you know, coming from Europe, you need at least one year, especially as a goalie, to learn the new angles and all that sort of thing. We very rarely see uh, AHL guy or KHL guys come over and go right to the National Hockey League. Yeah. So let me ask you this: Do you see um, David Riddick as the starter next year? I. Uh, the Flames would be in a bad position if he's the starter. Like I think that they need to get. Because he is a question mark. And, like, for the first half of the season, he was awesome. Then he got hurt, and he wasn't very good. And you don't have enough of a book on him to determine whether the guy that you saw pre-injury is him or the guy post-injury is him. Like, which one is more resembling what you're getting. And... The team, I think, needs to have another decent goalie in that. Even if you end up splitting the games like 45 to 35, that would be fine. I think you need to bring somebody else in who's penciled in for the starting job and tell Riddick, earn it. Yeah. I think Riddick could be the starter, but I don't think you come into the season assuming he's starting. Yeah, and that's why like the suggestion of Dubnik was thrown out there. Just a solid starter that, you know, would be an okay job if Riddick doesn't play well. I agree. I don't think that any of the farm guys are ready to be brought up. No. I mean, I think Gillies is the best option you've got if you need to go that way. But I, I don't think – I think Riddick is back for sure, and you need to find him a veteran partner. And we've talked we've talked at length about names out there, Talbot, Newverth, Mrazek, Leonard. Um, you know, free agents, if they can swing a trade, great. If not, and we'll talk more before July 1st, there's some decent names out there, but all the names that are free agents require a strong number two. And I think that's what Riddick's going to give them. Yeah. Um, do you think that with all that said, I mean, you've, you've kind of got guys moving around now. Parsons, he has been hurt this year. Do you think the flames give up on him or do you think they give him the, the AHL job again? I think the, all of the goalies currently in the organization get kept for a while and just another year at a minimum and just to see if they're making any forward progress and then reevaluate because they're all rather young like even uh mason mcdonald he's not that old and i think that you just kind of have to wait and see because like especially with mcdonald and schneider they both played better this year than previously Parsons struggled for most of the year. So it's I one think of with those... Zega Doolin coming in, he'll probably get the starting job in the A and it'll be, you know, Tyler earn it back. Sort of like we we're talking about with Riddick. Yeah. The only reason I could see them potentially giving up on McDonald is if they think that there's more potential in Schneider um, yeah. to start at the ECHL level and that they move on from uh, McDonald and let them find their own backup there. Yeah. It's one of those where, like, if they go one way or the other, it's kind of a shrug your shoulders and go meh. Because I think McDonald could probably move up to the HL next year, but we're not going to have room for him. Yeah, that's why it's kind of like you just, okay, you know, like, whichever decision you, you go about it, it the, how would you say, none of the goalies at all look particularly good at this point, so it's like... Uh, you know, you just kind of go in a holding pattern and say, show me something, please. Well, so. and, and I think that's like you were saying, I think it get, comes down to at the end of the year of, Hey, we've got enough bodies here. Somebody show us something. Yeah. And to their credit, both Schneider and McDonald played better this year than previously. Well, this so is also you, Schneider's first pro year. Yeah. So it's one of those where you go, okay, well, do you give him another shot in case he's, go like, say, with McDonald, in case he's going on that 
proper upward trajectory yeah. to be an NHL goaltender, it's too early to tell. And you just, it's too hard to say right yet. And we just have to wait and see. This is not a discussion that you're having in a lot of organizations. What do we do with all of our young goalies? It's very unique to Calgary right now, but, you know, a great place to be in, as we've talked about. Well, that's why you just got to keep getting goalies and keep throwing darts at the board, and eventually you get one that works. And if and, you he, get... and even if they don't work here, goalies are great trade pieces. Like, if we can start developing goalies to be used as trade pieces, that's a great option as well. Yep. You know, have your one guy like your Parsons and then a bunch of guys like Gillies who you get good enough and you send them off. And you get good enough and you send them off. Yeah, well, look at John Gibson in Anaheim. You know, they had both Anderson and Gibson and now they just have Gibson. And, it, you know, and they don't need a goaltender at all. And for most of the year, he was the best goalie in the league. It's true. Um, I, I won't get into quotes here, but just let everyone know that Monday, Easter Monday, was Black Garbage Bag Day for the Calgary Flames. That's the day that everyone clears out their lockers and talks to the media. Some interesting quotes from the players. They pretty much said what you expect them to say, but some good quotes there. So if you're interested in listening to some of those, uh, check out calgaryflames.com, and you'll see each one of the players. Even guys like Valimaki got interviewed. And in some of them, the press, I don't think is being hard, but I think is being uh, fairly critical like you know so what did you learn from this what do we take away from this and i think too often we get as we've talked about before we get half speak and sort of you know player answers the same ones all the time and i think there's some good ones in there especially the like tj brody interview where the media is saying you know give us something here what did you learn from this so if you're interested in that go check it out on the flames website um matt almost done here was uh, so we should probably mention a couple signings uh, the Calgary Flames have signed their, uh, what well, was he, fourth round, 105th overall pick in 2018, Martin Pospisil. And Pospisil's a, a Slovakian player. Uh, he's 19 years old. He's six foot two, 183 pounds, shoots left. He plays center, and he's been playing for the Sioux City Musketeers of the USHL. He has 63 total points over there. We talked last week sort of about projection of who got signed. I think Postville's another guy who might get a cup of coffee in the National Hockey League, but I think this is a pretty much an AHL career player. Yeah, he's very much a playmaker style of player, and he had a lot of points this year in the USHL. Next year, he will be playing in Stockton. Uh, he's a bit of or a hothead. in Kansas. Head. Yeah, true enough. I could he's see him bit- going in Kansas for a year. Yeah, he's a bit of a hothead, though, and uh, discipline's one of his main concerns. So, you know, it, we'll see. I like think his, with any his of the... upside at the highest end would be Jankowski. Yeah, uh, something along that line. If Th- he can get himself third, under control. Yeah, third, fourth line center at the upper end. And that that would be perfectly awesome mm. for a fourth round pick. It's just, you got to keep throwing darts at the board and hopefully one hits and... We saw with Manjapani, he's looking like a possible top six forward. Yeah. So, you know, it you just don't know. And it, that's why you just have to keep throwing darts at the board, getting as many high-quality skill players as possible. And I'm fix told their... I project this too often, but I think Pospisil, just because he has some, some talent on the ice, I see him being like a Pavel Brendel, where he's probably going to be around with a lot of teams over his career, but never really catch on. Could be. Um, Just have to wait and see. You know, each player is different, and the development path is not a linear process. So he's he has the tools. It's just how does he fix the problems in his game, and that's what will determine whether or not he or any of the other guys that the Flames have signed recently can they fix the things that are holding them back and. If so, great. Then you're you've got an, a potential NHL player, and if not, then they're just a decent AHLer for a few years, and then you go on to the next group. Well, and that's the problem when you're not drafting until rounds, you know, three, four, five, is you've got guys who have some some potential, but all obviously have some holes in their games, things they need to fix. And as you mentioned, Matt, the question is, can they fix those things? And you're not getting a, nearly as complete a player as you would if you drafted early. So you really have to ask yourself, are we willing to wait for this guy and how long are we willing to wait for this guy? Yep, and that's what good teams end up doing with their draft picks. Like, you look at Detroit over the years getting guys like Zetterberg and Datsuk and Nyquist and 
a whole host of guys, NFCU, who you mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, those guys weren't first round picks, and Tampa Bay it was very well, even much Goudreau, the same thing. Fourth round pick. Yeah, it, and Manjapani you know, our, a sixth round pick. Yeah, and, our captain undrafted. Yeah, it, like you have to hit home runs with your later picks in order to be a sustainable team and a sustainably good team for a long duration of time. And like Tampa has been very good for a long time. And that's because they've been hitting the mark with guys like Braden point, Andre Palat and the like, and you know, Calgary, Calgary needs to follow suit and be able to translate some of those guys into useful players throughout their lineup. And I mean, you look at some first rounders like Jankowski who are not necessarily a star on this team, but have proven their NHL caliber. And you look at guys, you know, who are fourth rounders like Goudreau and our first line caliber. So to me, you need, you know, if the guy, no matter where he comes up, he does, even if he's first line, he doesn't necessarily need to be, or sorry, first round pick. He doesn't necessarily need to be a first line player, but those first two, three rounds, you need guys that can play in the NHL four through seven. They're wild cards. Yeah. Uh, frankly, any draft pick, if you can make a legitimate NHLer out of it, awesome. And, yeah, uh, but if he, you're getting a first rounder, you can't even get a legitimate jeller out of. That's a bad sign. Well, yeah, a, true enough. But if that you're also a third depend, rounder, maybe it's okay. Yeah, well, it depends on what, uh, where you are in the draft as well. Like it's a lot different drafting, like say 26, like the Flames are this year, versus drafting in the top five. Well, I think even at 26, you should be able to find a guy who could at least play, th- you know, third and fourth line minutes. If there, if you can't find one guy out of the top 30, you know, who can, if you don't have 30 guys, you can play in the NHL. That's a bad draft. Yeah. And even if you have to jump down in the order to get that guy, there's always, I, I can't think of a draft where there hasn't been 45 guys that have made an NHL career. True enough. Um, the other one that we signed another uh, European prospect who came over and he's been playing in the KHL. It's Alexander Yellison, uh, defenseman, five foot eleven, 193 pounds, shoots right. He's been playing in Locomotive, um, was his, uh, I think, the best name for a, a team, Locomotive. Um, and he's been playing in the KHL there. And this season, he has 55 games, four goals, six assists for 10 total points, and 47 penalty minutes. So I think we might be getting our Anthony Peluso on the blue line with this guy. Yeah, he has a very hard slap shot, um, and he does hit very hard. Uh, some people have compared him to Alexei Emelin, uh, who played with Montreal and I think is now with Nashville. Just a solid all-around player I, I wouldn't be shocked if he was the flames third pairing right side defenseman next year See, I, I think with so much talent already it's going to be tough for this guy to to at least start the season here i know i agree it just i wouldn't be shocked if that's how it ended up working out okay it'd be better than some of the defensemen we've had lately sure in that bottom pairing like hagman or no sorry um yeah, no, 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 not Nick Hagstrom. We had, uh, who is that guy who went home? Hogstrom or something? Uh, we've had a number of guys. We, we had some Russian guy who went home on the blue line last year. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, yeah if, if he can make the NHL, great. If he can't, then you know what? We need some serviceable defensemen in the AHL too, so I think this is win-win. That was the biggest problem in Stockton this year was having serviceable NHL, you know, and even AHL quality guys. Yeah, and this is what I was mentioning previously with the Flames, where because of the lack of draft picks over the last handful of years, that they needed to go out and sign a bunch of European free agents to kind of supplement that. And we're seeing that the Flames have responded by getting Yellison and uh, Zagadulin and hopefully a few other guys. I wouldn't be shocked if the Flames dip into the well another for another player or two over the summer just because and why not. Yeah, I think there's, uh, I don't know, I think they've got the European guys they need. I think now it's time to start looking at some younger American guys, either in U.S. college or undrafted AHL. I just think that the success rate of the Europeans isn't as high, and I'd like to sort of mitigate our our risk by having some domestic guys, like a Spencer Fu type, who we bring in as an, you know, an unsigned college free agent. Yeah, well, the Flames just need to continue adding talent to the organization, and I really don't care where they're from. If they're good, hey, awesome. Yeah, you there's know. an there's enough talent out there. Yeah, 
We just have to find them. Yep. Well, Matt, I guess that just about brings us to the ep- to the end of this episode. That's probably the last time we're going to talk to everybody until probably the week before the draft. I uh, want to remind people we're doing it again this year, which is our audience participation survey. We want to know what you guys think of the podcast. You, we, your feedback is important to us. We want to make sure that we're giving you what you want, that everything that we're talking about is what you want to see. Are we spending too much time on something that's not interesting to you, or is there something more you'd like us to do? And we always reward our fans. We have a mystery box of Flames and Fireside Chat merchandise that we give away. We never say exactly what's going to be in there, but usually there's some hats, some mugs, um, maybe a T-shirt or two, and we'll be giving that away again. So... We we ask you to take the survey. It'll probably take you five, ten minutes. If you just want to take it, that's cool. If you want to be entered to win the prize, we just ask you that you leave your first your first and last name and your email address at the end of the survey so we can get a hold of you. If you don't want to do that, that's cool. You just won't be entered to win the prize. Um, but if you want in, we'd love to, to have you in that draw, and we'll probably give that away in early July, right after the rookie camp. So, you can get to that. It'll be in the show notes, but it's easy to remember, firesidechat.ca slash survey. And we'd love to hear your, everyone's thoughts. Matt, I think that's about it. Yeah. Wish that we were talking for longer the, and into May, but, you know, things happen. And hopefully that this is a big learning experience for the team. And honestly, I think for the long term, that getting thoroughly embarrassed like they were in this series may end up being a benefit down the road because of the fact that they'll they might have to overcompensate in terms of being extra prepared for the postseason and i think that might end up making them even more successful if that's the case so well i think every year that tree's been here we've seen this team get a bit better and a bit better and i think you know we're really now seeing a playoff caliber roster but now we have to get that roster to be, you know, in the top two or three in the West. Yeah. And frankly, I think that this team repeats as the Pacific Division champion uh, next season. And I'm, it'll be between us and Vegas, I think, for next year. And we'll see. And, you know, the team has a lot of things that it needs to work on. And we'll see how they do over the course of the offseason. There's plenty of things that they can do. Yeah, for sure. And and hopefully we will, uh, you know, when you and I talk next, either for the draft or just after, hopefully we're already seeing some positive steps in that direction. Yeah, I'm expecting several trades and I would be somewhat surprised if the Flames have their first round pick at the draft, but we'll get into that. I'd be surprised if they have theirs. I wouldn't be surprised that at the end of the day, they end up with a first or a high second. Yeah, possible. All right, Matt. Well, we'll talk to you again in uh, what mid June before the draft. Have yep. a have a great uh, start to your summer and uh, enjoy whoever it is you're cheering for. Now it should be an interesting playoff. Uh, nobody and who cares. <laughs> have a good summer, everyone. Thanks for listening, as always. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.